My junior year in high school, we made it all the way to state championships in basketball. We had a really good basketball team. There was this one team named uh, Sparta, was the name of the school. And no matter what, uh, we knew we were, we were a better team, and every time we played them in the regular season, we would annihilate them. And I mean like 40, 50 points, which back then, was before three-pointers were even popular, so I mean, we were beating them badly. Then we played them in three tournaments. We played them in a Thanksgiving tournament, a Christmas tournament, first two. They beat us in the championship game of both of those tournaments. Then we played them in the state tournament for the state championship, right? We both made it to the finals. We go into overtime in this just crazy kid who wasn't even, in my opinion, that athletic, throws up a three-pointer in overtime, banks it in at the buzzer, and we lost. It was brutal. We were all laying in the floor crying. Like the principal was coming by telling us to get up. You're shaming the school. Don't act like this. But it literally, that happened. But it just felt so unfair. Like It felt so unfair. And that was just a, you know, You know, 11th grade lesson for me on something that's been true many times since then, life isn't fair, right? Some of you found that a lot earlier than uh, than others of us. Like maybe your fifth grade teacher was super easy on this one kid, even though he had a bad attitude and acted like a punk, but for some reason uh, she liked him, even though she was hard on you and you tried to do everything right, right? So maybe in fifth grade you experienced... uh, uh, unfairness in the classroom. Maybe um, you have a mediocre car, uh, coworker, but they just have a truckload of charisma, and they're you know, <laughs> they're they're not really getting it done. Like they're not turning things in on time. They're showing up late, leaving early, and they're getting seen and promoted over you in the workplace, even though you're knocking it out of the park, and it just doesn't make sense. Maybe. Um, your home life is harder than your friends. Maybe you work out. Maybe you count every single calorie and, uh, you know, your, your, your buddy over here is eating a pub sub like five days a week and not, not caring about anything. and not gain- Everybody knows nobody's eating pub subs right now. That would be like $600 if you ate five a week. But in theory, he's eating five pub subs a week, not worrying about it, not gaining any weight because his metabolism is better. And you're like, what's going on here, Right. Maybe you've got uh, some genetic stuff you're dealing with. Maybe you're, you're sick. Maybe you've been dealing with sickness and you're looking at other people around you and they're not dealing with sickness. Maybe you're super careful about your health, but you're experiencing a season where your health is bad and other people that don't worry about their health are fine, right? Why are bad things happening to good people and um, why is the world the way that it is? Life isn't fair. If you live long enough, you will understand that. These are conversations that... Parents start having with their children early in a way that they can understand life's not going to be fair in every single way. But we're in this series called Kingdom Dynamics, and the good thing is is that once you come into the kingdom, once you profess faith, once you join God and his work in the world, once you become a follower of Christ, once you're clothed in him and now you belong to him, God's always fair. Actually, one thing that makes the kingdom dynamic, and I'm going to have to convince you on this one, is God's not fair. Okay? God is not fair. So here's a verse I want to start with, and then we'll pray. (laughs) Then Peter said to him, behold. Okay? Peter just screamed, behold, we have left everything and followed you What then will there be for us? Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We love you this morning. We submit our hearts to you. I pray that what Melissa was encouraging us to do during um, the time of approaching your table, we will continue to do, and that is remove whatever is uh, consuming us in this moment, shift it aside. There's nothing we can do about it for the next few minutes and seek you, and open ourselves up to what you have for us in your scriptures. In your name we pray. Amen. So this catches us like in the middle of a fairly famous story. If you're familiar with the scriptures, if you're not familiar with the scriptures, 
I'll tell you what happens. So basically, Jesus has just had this encounter with this really wealthy young guy that comes up to him, makes this very demonstrative statement, walks up to him in front of everyone, goes right before Jesus and says, I've kept all the commandments since I was a kid. I've done this, 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 this. What else do I need to do to inherit the kingdom? And Jesus knows what's really going on in this guy's heart, so he calls out what's really going on in this guy's heart, and that's that he knows if he asked him to count the cost on one thing, he won't be willing to do it, or Jesus is just going to give him a chance to submit and cooperate. So Jesus says, well, look, uh, why don't you sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me? And the guy had a lot, so the scripture says that he walks away sad. So then Jesus, which was typical in his teaching, he uses this really big hyperbole to kind of shake up the people around him. You know, sometimes you have to do that. You have to, um, I'm not really good at it. I'll just use like an emoji on a slide. (laughs) But Jesus was really good at it. So he'll shake up the room by saying something super drastic, like it's easier to squeeze a camel through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to go to heaven. Now, what did that mean? It didn't mean that wealthy people can't go to heaven. What he was saying is nothing can grab hold of us like material things. Nothing can grab hold of us like material things. So that would have just shaken up the room, though, because if you read the Old Testament, you see like so much connection between like Abraham and God's favor through the things that uh, Abraham was allowed to walk in and the blessings. And then you see Moses and you hear the story of the promised land. And it's like, wait a minute, God, this is confusing. What are you trying to say? So then, of course, my man Peter pipes up, right? Like, Peter pipes up. We, go back to that verse. We've left everything and followed you, okay? Peter's kind of like Hamilton, like, talk less. Thank you. Peter's kind of like Hamilton, talk less. Have you guys seen Hamilton? Fine. Some of you are still protesting it. I respect that. Everybody loves it. You're not going to watch it. Ooh, I wish I would have held the line. All right. So, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? So Jesus actually says some good stuff here. He says, truly I say to you that you who have followed me, he's probably turned around specifically talking to the 12 right here. And in the regeneration, or when everything's made new, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also will sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Keep going. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or farms, for my sake, will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. That seems right. Like that, that seems fair, okay? And that seems good. There should be deep encouragement in that for you. So if you look at all that he's saying there, I think you could boil it down to three categories that would totally align with us today. So if you've left like houses or if you left brother, sister, father, mother, children, um, or farms. So he's basically saying if following me has in any way cost you financially, cost you relationally, or cost you professionally, you need to know that you're going to receive fullness in the kingdom. You are storing up treasure in heaven. There is fullness for you. He's telling us 12, like you guys have literally left everything. Like everyone has this call to follow me, but you guys have have represented a different group in that you've walked away from a lot. Like your families are having to figure it out. You've had hard conversations with people. You're taking a step out. If I'm going to suffer, you're going to suffer, all of these things. So anyone who's left those things, believe me, there will be a fulfillment for you in eternity. And that seems right. And that seems fair. But then he says this, verse 30. But many who are first will be last And the last first. Many who are first will be last and the last first. So it's like if Peter would have piped up again right there, he probably would have said, like, I liked the thing you said right before the thing you just said. We should have stopped there. Two statements ago were gold. Why'd you keep going? Right? What do you mean first, last, last, first? Jesus says, circle up, boys. Let me tell you a little story. Okay? For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. 
When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, like a day's wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group. So beginning with those at like 11 hours into the job that I, that I threw out there, okay? Beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. So I've only got... Uh, high school sports stories for you today. <laughs> um, when I was uh, playing football, uh, you know, you start, at least back then, I don't know now, they're so much more careful, but at least back then in late summer, you'd go out and start two-a-days. A lot of times before the school year started, you, just to get in shape because you'd just been living like a teenager in the summer, so you were in terrible condition, and they would get you back out there and start practicing twice a day because the first game was usually two or three weeks into the school year. So we had this one kid. Um, I won't name him, but uh, he was uh, related to the athletic director. All right, I'll leave it at that. All right. And for two years in a row, he would decide uh, just so conveniently after two a days were over, and we were just a few weeks from the first game, that he all of a sudden wanted to play football, right? And um, he had some connections at the top, so we sort of had to make space for him and let him in and let him play, even though he wasn't there throwing up with us over the summer, you know, doing two-a-days, right? And it offended me even more so because we played the same position. So it meant I was competing with this guy who was, you know, obviously a bad person. So... That was probably, you know, there's probably some space there to say, hey, that, maybe we shouldn't have let him do that. But that's the closest connection and a playful way that I can think of, of the injustice that these guys were probably feeling. So you imagine being out in the hot, I mean, Middle Eastern heat, dry heat, working all day long. And then people join in. And you know the, the guys that join in about three hours, that's all right because, you know, after another six or seven hours, it just kind of feels like they've been there the whole time. They've earned it, right? But the ones that came in for one hour, one hour, they could go out to dinner in the same clothes, <laughs> like still just fresh, clean, smell like Axe body spray when they're done. They can go out. So you go wait a minute, now not only they showed up late, now I've got to go to the end of the line because these are the ones that are going to get paid first. So you go, you know what, that's fine because I'll, you know, they're probably renegotiating everything. And then you go, oh, yeah, so those guys, they're getting, they're getting what we originally were going to get, so we're probably going to get time and a half, double. You know, we've, we've, we've got a good surprise coming our way, Right. And then you get all the way up there and you realize you worked all day, they worked an hour, and you got the same thing. Well, that's not fair. And Jesus is saying the kingdom's like this. Hmm. It's no good. Like, I don't want that to be. Okay, I don't want the kingdom to be like that. So... The story says that they were murmuring, but if, if you study that a little bit, it's like they continued, like they, they, they continued to, to chatter. So 
Verse 13, the landowner kicks in here. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give the last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And Peter probably didn't say anything for at least an hour after that. (laughs) Now the eye is interesting. I'm not going to spend the time going into it, but if you go back a few chapters into early Matthew, you see the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus talks a lot about the eye, how it's the lamp of the body, and how, you know, the way... The way that we're viewing things is important. So he's saying, are you, are you viewing what I'm doing uh, with an envious eye because it bothers you that I'm generous to these other workers? Do they not have mouths to feed? Do they not have the same needs that you do? Does it go against the grain with you inwardly that I want to be generous to them? that I want to provide to them. And I think a question that would just be on the table here, if you were standing around listening to Jesus teach this story, is what does God owe us? Nothing. And that's fair. That's fair. Some of us are trapped in broken thinking patterns that we're owed. Now, it could start with God, but you may not even realize that it has anything to do with God. It may not even be someone that believes in Christ. It may just be someone that's a part of society right now that's drifted into a spirit and an attitude of entitlement. Right now, taking responsibility for your life is like a foreign notion. We're all supposed to cater to each other. We're we're all supposed to lower ourselves to the lowest common denominator and cater. Some people, maybe some of us, live like the world is always happening to you, okay? Like life's life's always happening to me. Now listen, there are real victims in this world. There may be real victims in this room. But if you're not a real victim, but you live your life like a victim, you live your life entitled like everybody owes you, then I would hope that at some point you would experience remorse and conviction about that because that's not helping you and that's not helping those around you to live that way with that mindset as if the world is happening to you. Some of us translate the mindset of being owed this way horizontally to our relationship with God. Some of us translate the mindset of being owed to our relationship with God. It's a hard pill to swallow in 2024 American culture because we just want God to owe us. We just want him to be Santa Claus and give us whatever we need, give us whatever we want, and uh, bend his will to ours. And you might be able to find that teaching somewhere, but anybody who's really going to hold firm to the scriptures can't teach you that because that's simply not true. Now, what does God give us through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Every good thing forever. Okay? What does God owe us Let's review. What does God owe us? But what does God give us through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Every good thing in Him forever. That's not fair. That's not fair. The fact that God owes us nothing, the fact that we are at His mercy, 
okay? We are literally at his mercy. Now, you can stand up and you can you could look you could come to me and you could make any demand you want because I don't have any real moral high ground over you. I haven't, you know, I I haven't extended my grace towards you and saved you and redeemed you from your from your waywardness. So you might say, Jared, I can't believe that you would, you know, and you could do that with each other. But the one person, the one being that we cannot stand, put our finger in his face and say, you owe me is the one who has, who, whose mercy we are literally living under. We're under his mercy. This is mercy, right? He's been merciful to us. Not just God loves you, which he does. Not just God sent his son for you, which he did. Not just God fills you with his spirit and his presence, which he does. But never forget, he's also merciful and kind when we are wayward and self-seeking. Paul wrote, we were enemies working against his purposes in the world. Actively dishonoring him and he had mercy on us. So he doesn't owe us anything. But what's so unfair about that? is that while he, while he owes us nothing, he's given us, God has given us himself as father, loving, adopted, we're in his family, every good gift. Through his son, he's given us our Lord, our Savior, our brother, the one who bore the weight of our sin. And through his spirit, he's filled us, he's brought us back to life. He's given us the ability to actually please him and serve him and love him and honor him with our lives. So what we have actually is not fair. And then Jesus also says, ask, seek, knock, and my Father gives good gifts to those who ask Him. Okay? So not only do we have treasure in heaven, not only do we have an eternity with Him, not only has He prepared a place, not only does the one who owes us nothing is giving us everything in Him, But he also says, right now, in the present, as you live in this world, ask, seek, knock, and my Father gives good gifts to those who ask him. That's super not fair. Okay? That's super not fair. What we get is disproportionately better. Disproportionately lopsided and better than what we could ever deserve. So where do we get it wrong? I think it's all about our motive and our desire. What do we want most? Tim Keller wrote this, and uh, this should be seen as two contrasting statements. I obey God in order to get things from God, or I obey God to get God to delight in Him and to resemble Him. How many of you ever fallen into a space to where you're feeling like it's all on you and how good you're doing to keep God's favor and goodness and love flowing towards you. Man, I've lived long seasons there. How many of you have ever felt like because you messed up or dropped the ball, like all of a sudden God's goodness, kindness, mercy, and all the good things that flow to you are now going to stop and change? Yeah, I felt that, I've, I've felt that too. Like I'm, I'm, I'm the one that's balancing the way God loves me and God is for me and God is you know, after me. But that's not what he's asked us to do. He's asked us to follow him because we get him. He's asked us to serve him for the sake of relationship with him. We can get into this idea of manipulating God and we don't even realize it. If I can do so many good things for him, then I'll get this. And if I don't do all these bad things, then I can have this. But God doesn't make those deals. He's not fair. Okay? We don't get to earn from him. We get to enjoy him. We get to ask him. We get to love him. We get to walk with him, be with him, do life with him. God's not fair. Now, here's where it gets really good. You think you screwed up your life and now you can't serve the purposes of God. God's not fair. Yes, you can. You think I've gone too far God gave me this chance, this chance, this chance, and this chance, and I knew that if I messed up one more time, I would blow it, and it's all over with, and there's nothing I can do. God's not fair. It's not over. This relationship has no hope. I've ruined it. I'll never have a relationship with my kids again. God's not fair. He can redeem it. It happens. I've fallen into financial uh, 
turmoil. There's no way I can dig out of this mess. There's no way that I can find hope. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. God's not fair, man. He can restore what the enemy's stolen. He can restore what you've lost. He can bring things back to life that are dead. God's not fair, right? He doesn't deal with us fairly. He deals with us disproportionately to the opposite through grace. And then this means that we get to live unfairly toward others. I want to leave you with this verse and then we'll pray. Romans 12. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, this may not be the happy-go-lucky message of the season, but there's deep truth in here. Okay? There's deep truth in here and that what uh, Jesus draws a direct correlation between those who are receiving mercy and our ability to show mercy. Those who are receiving love and our ability to show love. So to the degree that we understand that God has dealt so unbelievably and lavishly unfairly with us is to the degree that we will have the fervor and the energy and the spiritual strength and fruit to deal unfairly, right? We don't, get to, we don't do eye for an eye. We don't do you did this, so I do this. We don't keep it even. We don't keep it balanced. We don't reciprocate. We pray for our enemies. We don't just pray for those that are kind to us. We pray for our enemies. We bless those who curse us, and we, we return evil with good. Amen? All right. You guys stand. Now, I don't know what kind of emotion comes up in you when you think about God and fairness. Some of you, you know, we haven't been quiet about it. Some of us are in really hard seasons right now. Maybe your season just feels gray. And you know something here, but you need God to make it real here. Okay? You know something here, but you need him to make it real here. I want to wait just, just a moment. that psalm. Uh, I feel like I need to read it. My phone's in the outside pocket of that. I don't remember the number, Joss, of this psalm.
Fargo. Before I close your eyes, I want to read this short psalm over you. Psalm 131, Song of Ascents of David. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Lord, we do not know why. And we may never on this side understand why. And as unfair as it feels, Lord, we know that you have layered manifold wisdom that understands the universe that's still expanding. You can see right now in real time stars, you just all of it, Lord, we know you're all consuming. And we release ourselves from being concerned with things that are too wonderful for us. And we approach you as children. We don't know in the end game of all the ways that you're seeing the scales and balancing things and working things out, but you just say you're our father, so we're going to approach you like your children. As someone said earlier, approach you like your children and ask and seek and knock. God, it's too much for us. It's too much. It's too big. All of it's just too big. So we surrender it or even surrender our false sense of control over it and we acknowledge that it's you and that it's yours. choose to believe the disproportionately unfair way that you deal with us and that you have immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine in store for us in this life and in the life to come. As I'm praying this and, and, and thinking of, of just this idea that God is full, God is full. And if we were all standing around a giant cup of his water, so pretend where I am is a giant cup of his water. We could all come forward and drink from that cup. And that cup would remain full. Okay. We could all drink until we were thirsty no more. But the cup, the water level wouldn't go down. It would remain full. He's full. He's so, like, it, it, it's, it's like... The closest thing I can think is like self-replenishing, but he doesn't have to do that. He's, he is fullness. He fills his universe. He's all in all. Okay? So there's a fullness to the Lord. It'd probably be, the water would be like spilling over, splashing, getting on our shoes. 
That's how full it would be. There is no lack. There is no, there's enough for this person. I better not approach the cup. There's enough for them. I better not come forward. Their need is 0.2% more important than my need. So I'm not going to come forward. That's an excuse that you're telling yourself because you're operating under this whole God's fair thing. You need to break out of that. God's not worried about who's got the greatest need. I've got one broken arm. They've got two. I've got one stubbed toe. They've got two. No, don't operate that way. God's not fair. He's full. He can deal with your mosquito bite. And this person over here's got something much worse. He can deal with all of it. And he's and in his fullness, he, he, he can and he asks us to come. So all of these excuses that we make in our minds based on his fairness and all of that, you might, be at, you might feel like you're at the end of the line. You're going you're gonna to get asked to come first and then he's going to blow you away and that you got paid with the people who'd been there 12 hours were paid. I mean, we got Jesus' last breaths for giving this guy next to him on the cross, right? Paradise, me and you today, buddy. Paradise. That's full. That's a full cup, okay? So we want to come and we want to drink. And some of you, I think, um, in his fullness, he fills. You need to be refilled. You need to be replenished. You need, you need a new dousing. You need a new encounter with him. You need, you need prayer. You need the spirit. You need the, um, the living water. He tells the woman at the well, right? Okay, here we go. I've got biblical precedent for my little picture of a cup now. The woman at the well, there's going to be springs in you that burst forth that never stop. Okay, there we go. Some of you that are uncomfortable with pictures and all that, there you go. There's your Bible verse, all right? You have no excuse. There's fullness. There's fullness. So Jesus, we pray right now for everyone here. God, I pray for their disposition. I pray for their their, the thoughts that are happening inwardly, the emotions that are being felt. And Lord, we just come, we we, uh, uh, pray that all of those will be submitted to you and that we'll trust you. We won't think thoughts about you and your fairness. We'll think thoughts about you and your extravagant grace. And that'll help us step out in faith and come and drink. In your name we pray. Amen. So if you need, if that resonates with you, you're like, man, I'm, I've gotten a few months into this year and I am just dry. I need to, I need to, I need, I need to believe. I, I, I need prayer. I need ministry. I need to worship. I need to come forward. Then I want to invite you right now to come forward. seasons. There's no shame in it, man. Sometimes you just need something. Sometimes you're stepping out and you're asking God to meet you where you are and you're, you know what's true, but you want to believe it fully. You want it to grip you. That's okay. Come down. to pray this morning. I'll ask you to come forward too. And those of, the, those, those of you that are down here, if you want prayer, most of you are already doing it, but you just lift your palms and we're going to pray for you. God has water for you. God has water for you. Jesus, we pray that you will be with these ministers as they pray and that you'll open the hearts here 
uh, that are receiving. And God, let your ministry happen. We pray for what you have for each and every person. We pray that you'll meet them where you are. In your name.